Good morning. My name is Moises Naim. I am with the Carnegie Endowment, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session today. Ebola, the Russian invasion of Crimea, the plummeting oil prices, the surging ascent of uh, ISIS in the, in the Middle East. Um, which of the things were part of the conversation last year in Davos? And they changed the world. They defined 2014, and they also pointed to uh, the fact that, two facts, to how difficult it is to predict uh, these trends, and also how they come from, uh, in contrast to prior years, in which many of the risks that were at the center of our conversations had to do with markets and financial crisis and uh, all of the, 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 the economic financial dimension of uh, global risks. This year, um, paramount in our minds and paramount in our discussions here in Davos are geopolitical risks, risks that are not derived necessarily from the behavior of uh, markets, financial institutions, economic agents, but uh, risks that come from uh, decisions by governments uh, or non-governmental organizations, or surprises like uh, a pandemic, like uh, Ebola, for example. So the question is, how are markets uh, pricing these risks? Are uh, markets assigning a correct value? Are, there, are, are these risks being underestimated, overestimated? Uh, to, we're going to debate. This is a highly controversial issue. Uh, and we are going to have uh, a very spirited debate with four very distinguished panelists. Two of them are going to argue that, yes, markets are misunderstanding and mispricing these risks. And others are going to argue, and two others are going to argue that markets are, in fact, uh, capturing uh, the, the, the consequences and the, and the, the pr that pricing is accurate. Uh, to do this, we are lucky to have with us uh, Natalie Ann Jarensko, to my right. She's the Minister of Finance uh, of the Ukraine. Minister, pleasure to have you here. I'm not uh, going to read the very long, very distinguished list of achievements of our uh, uh, panelists, but uh, you have them in, in, in your <laughs> books. Um, then it's Nuria Rubini, who needs no introduction. He is a professor of economics. Um, at New York University and uh, well known for his um, understanding of global economics. Uh, Paul Singer is also well known. He manages the Elliott Fund. Uh, he, it's a, it's, it's a uh, hedge fund. Uh, and uh, he's a founder, chief executive officer, and co-chief investment officer of Elliott Management. Welcome. Uh, Paul Singer. And Martin uh, Sen is uh, uh, the Group Chief Executive Officer for Zurich Insurance Group in Switzerland uh, and is a member of the International Business Council. Uh, and uh, welcome and delighted to have you with us. Before um, going with the debate, uh, we have been asking the world what they think about this uh, through social media. And we have had some results. Uh, mostly 67% uh, of the people that answered through social media agree that markets are mispricing geopolitical risks. But also, we want to ask you. And uh, we are, through your cell phones, by very easily, conveniently logging into that um, uh, page, wef.ch forward slash vote, you can agree or disagree with the notion that markets are mispricing political risks. So w w I'm going to ask you to do this <coughs> twice, now and then after the debate has, has concluded. And let's see uh, if uh, the debate has changed uh, the mood and the opinions of, uh, of this room. So let's really start uh, to vote. See if you can log into that page and see if you can vote. We're going to take a few minutes to let you do that.
This session is also being broadcast, uh, and uh, it's also being widely discussed uh, in social media. You can go, if you're in Twitter, you can go on hashtag WEF15, uh, and uh, that, all, that, that is the sessions for the World Economic Forum, and this one is also there. And it will also be uh, broadcasted in YouTube. No vote means disagree, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So let's uh, take a look at what are the results. 37 people have uh, uh, answered. And again, 70-30 um, agree that markets are mispricing political risk. And let's hear the first panelist that is going to agree with that is going to defend uh, the notion that markets are not doing a good job of capturing that risk. And for that, we have Minister Jarensko from, the U from Ukraine. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. I do agree that history has shown that markets have often mispriced the risk. I think there are several reasons why that happens, and I think Ukraine is an example of that today. So I'll just walk through that argumentation. Hopefully, when I'm finished, the, 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 the statistics will be in my favor, and I won't have convinced you otherwise. I think there, that history has shown, for example, in the 2008 global crisis, that the markets weren't ready for what the systemic effect of that crisis would be, and they mispriced, and in fact, that in fact contributed to, to, the, to the size of the crisis because they, the markets underpriced the risk that, that, that the system was going to collapse and that the turmoil would, would occur in the way it did. I think the Eurozone <coughs> collapse has been also misjudged and overpriced in, in time. I think that uh, it's overpriced because the expectations were not being achieved in the end, and, and the Eurozone is today uh, basically where it was before, despite all of the overpriced risk. I, I think there are three reasons why you're seeing this mispricing happen. F first and foremost, I think investors are reacting to their own market appetite, not necessarily to uh, the specifics of, of what's happening. They're looking at their own portfolios, their own up, up managed risk, and, and what they would like to achieve and where they are at that given moment. So in some cases, for example, with Eurozone periphery countries, it's gone back and forth. For my country in Ukraine, uh, at one time before the crisis, perhaps that was risk that was underpriced. After the crisis, it seems that anything outside of the Eurozone has been overpriced. The, the second reason is it's a perceived risk. There is no objective risk to be priced, and it's per perception. It's, it's the press, it's market sentiments. It's uh, who does a better or worse job of presenting their case in the markets and how it's read. Um, this emotional element is impossible to quantify perfectly. And finally, I think to a great extent, investors tend to move in mass in directions that, uh, that they move together, both in and out of markets and in the pricing. Uh, they could be right or wrong, and, and not many people are willing to buck the system. There aren't many Nouriel Rubinis willing to uh, go against uh, the masses in the market. Ukraine, in, in essence, has often seen this in, in the pricing of, of our risk. Um, if you look at our real economic situation, it's been systemically overpriced from my perspective since the 2008 crisis. Our CDS spreads were extraordinary in 2009, predicting a default which never occurred. Ukraine maintained its payments and continued to be uh, uh, a, a good uh, borrower and I think, to a great extent, a lot of this mispricing occurs in, with, with Ukraine because outside of Ukraine, people don't recognize or price in the resilience of the nation, the strength of the people, their willingness to pay the costs of change, uh, which we saw during our revolution of dignity and, and thereafter now in the unfortunate war in eastern Ukraine. I think also there's a misperception with Ukraine right now and when you look at our CDS price as to how large uh, of a financial support package the country may need and or what that means. If you, if you compare it, uh, the numbers that have been in the press, in, in the Wall Street Journal, the London Financial Times, uh, the $15 billion in comparison to what Greece required, uh, on a per capita basis, this is a tiny, uh, tiny sum of money. It is not an amount of financial, international financial support that is so incredibly difficult to raise. It is a reasonable amount of money for a country of 45 million people. I think it's also important to note that the economic crisis is not simply a financial calculation for Ukraine. The economic crisis is in Ukraine uh, created to a great extent because of both the war and the legacy of the corrupt regime that uh, ended its, its term last, uh, last winter, a year ago. 
And today, the Ukrainian government is addressing all of these issues. It's addressing, number one, the corruption and uh, moving very quickly and very uh, meaningfully with an anti-corruption bureau, with changes in the judicial system. Number two, we're moving very quickly to uh, and, and doing everything possible to support an end to the conflict in the East. Our president has said over and over, he is a president of peace. That is our goal. Our goal is peace. We are, yes, investing 5% of our GDP this year into rebuilding our military, but that is all to be in, in, in the proper position to defend our country, nothing more. And finally, the fundamental structural reforms that have not occurred in the past 23 years of Ukraine's existence are starting today with a very capable government, with a very reform-oriented government, and with changes each and every day that are being implemented. All of, this, uh, are, all of these elements, I think, are hard for the markets to price. They look simply at the statistics, simply at the numbers, and not at the human element, which in Ukraine has been probably one of the key uh, factors that make the markets wrong in their pricing of risk. As a nation today, Ukraine is stronger than the markets uh, are pricing it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Jaresko. Uh, Professor Rubini, Nouriel, do you mm -hmm. disagree with this? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm somebody that usually thinks that markets are not efficient, that the bubble can occur, that tail risk like financial crisis can occur. But I would make the following arguments. Uh, there are booms, there are busts. They are mispricing, but the question is, do market misprice worse or uh, worse than otherwise geopolitical risk as opposed to economic and financial ones? And I'm not sure about that. I mean, there are some, first of all, unknown unknowns that are really major tail events. Last year in Davos, people said there might be a war between China and Japan. Markets were not pricing it. Guess what? That war did not occur, and so far the tension has been reduced. The tensions in Asia between China and many of its neighbors, but that risk of a major thing is not going to happen. Uh, think about terrorism. Uh, yes, there was a terrible attack uh, in Paris. There had been an attack in London, in Madrid before. Uh, what's the chance of another 9-11 type of attack? I think it's very low. So if you have a very low probability of a major event, like a major war, a major terrorist attack, the fact that Ebola could become a global pandemic as opposed to be a regional one, are the markets really mispricing these things or not? Guess what? SARS, Ebola, and so on, terrible. Thousands of people have died in Africa. It had not a global economic impact. Take uh, the risk of a war in Asia, has not occurred, and so on. Take another major terrorist attack. So things that are really major tail events that are very low probability but high impact, the question is should markets price them in usually when their probability is very low? Probably markets are rational not to do so. Now, there are other events. Last year, you have the Middle East is a mess. It's not just ISIS, Syria, Iraq, but what's going on all over the Middle East is imploding. Guess what? Oil prices instead are falling. There's been the Russian-Ukraine conflict and the potential global spillovers. There's been Ebola. There's been other tensions in many parts of the world. Now, the way I think of it is this way. Uh, take, for example, the situation in the Middle East. What has happened last year is a paradox because oil prices have collapsed in spite of the geopolitical situation that is becoming worse. But compare it with the past. In 1973, we had a global supply shock that was Yom Kippur war between Israel and the Arab Strait. Embargo, oil prices tripled. In 1979, we had Iranian Revolution, another embargo, oil prices tripled. In 1990, we had the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, shock to the supply of oil, oil prices spiked. Uh, this time around doesn't happen. Why? First of all, in spite of the mess in the Middle East, take even Iraq, 90% of the production is either in the South, Shia control, or the Kurdistan. And even the 10% that is module and nearby control of the ISIS, these guys are producing and trying to smuggle oil. So there's not been a supply shock to the supply of oil. Take Russia, Ukraine, terrible geopolitical <laughs> impact, terrible on the economy of Ukraine, even on Russia, but there has not been yet a shock to the supply of gas from Russia to Western Europe. If that were to occur, of course, the economic and financial implication will be severe. And not only there hasn't been a supply shock to oil in the Middle East, but now because of the shale, gas, and oil revolution, US, North America, because even the uh, problems in the Middle East have led to more production this year, in Iran, in Iraq, in Libya, there's a glut in the supply of oil. And guess what? Oil prices have collapsed because the basic balance between demand and supply is supply is growing much more than demand. And demand is slowing down because of the slowdown in Eurozone, in Japan, in China, and other emerging markets. So when you compare to the past, have we mispriced the shock that comes from the Middle East in terms of oil? No. There are other fundamental reasons why these things happen. 
Same thing with Russia and Ukraine. Actually, the market has been pricing significant impact on the economy of Russia and Ukraine. Their currency have weakened, the stock markets have done down, spreads have widened. The minister correctly says that maybe the CDS are mispricing, but guess what? Under some scenario, your public debt to GDP ratio might be closer to 100%. Under some scenario, the international community may not be willing to give a full package. Under some scenario, some form of orderly bail-in or restructuring or reprofiling of debt could occur. I was in the White House when in 99, we did one of the first example of a reprofiling of debt, sovereign bonds, was Ukraine after Pakistan. So these events can occur, and the market's saying there's some probability that the orderly restructuring of your debt is going to happen. It's not just a bail-in or a bail-out. Some bail-in, some PSI can occur. I can see your argument why it shouldn't occur, and it's a legitimate argument, but markets are pricing a meaningful probability that the international community is not going to give you enough money, and there's an orderly case for restructuring. So when you look at this risk, you have to think about them. Are they so large and significant that they have an economic and financial impact that the markets are not pricing them correctly? Of course, there is overshooting on the way up, on the way down, but markets are pricing these risks. Thank you, Nuriel Rubini. Paul Singer, you disagree with that? So far, we've been talking about markets as if um, independent actors, uh, millions or uh, tens of millions of investors, are pricing the markets. This is not actually true in today's uh, environment. And there are two major reasons why markets are mispricing uh, geopolitical and other uh, risks. Um, the first one is very straightforward. The uh, largest by far um, investor in the world's uh, stock and bond markets, uh, all on the buy side, of course, are the major uh, developed world uh, governments, uh, the central banks. And um, what, they've, what they've done is distorted the prices of financial assets um, so that you don't know what the actual price is. So I would actually put the word markets uh, in quotes uh, uh, in, um, in, in this uh, resolution. Um, uh, fact, um, uh, the United States uh, Central Bank, the Fed, uh, uh, has been purchasing, has purchased the majority of the issuance of, um, of government um, medium and longer term debt in the, uh, the post-crisis period. Uh, at first, of course, under emergency conditions, but second, um, as is the case in Europe and Japan, because the fiscal authorities uh, have uh, not been taking the steps uh, and, uh, that every uh, 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 economist knows uh, would be pro-growth uh, steps on taxes, regulation, uh, trade authority, uh, education. Um, um, so, uh, and in Japan, uh, currently the central bank owns 1.5% of the capitalization of the uh, Japanese stock market, and, and they are about to embark on a, um, uh, an, an even larger program. So if it doesn't work, meaning um, uh, restart growth or, or restore growth to pre-financial crisis conditions, um, the solution is, um, uh, so far, uh, buy more, double down. Um, and Europe seems on the verge <clears throat> of doubling down. So, uh, the first reason is you don't know what the price is in the absence of that buying. That buying is not millions of informed investors or in investors that are trying to uh, uh, inform themselves about the correct price. And so what we have is, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, as we speak, the 30-year swap in Europe uh, is trading at around 1.27 percent. And um, if anyone thinks that that price um, is A, the price that uh, uh, is, a, is a reasonable or fair price to invest to meet your investment assumptions, your actuarial assumptions, your liability assumptions over the next 30 years. I, um, uh, I, think, that's, I think that's just uh, uh, wrong. Um, uh, uh, B, um, uh, uh, giving, it, if, you, if you accept that price as, okay, that's the price, that's the price that I can invest uh, in 30-year uh, bonds in, in uh, Europe, and there's a lower price, uh, lower yield in Japan, and somewhat higher uh, in the United States. Um, um, what, about, um, uh, what about inflation? What about the possibility of inflation? Well, um, inflation is a byproduct, partially a byproduct, of some of the geopolitical risks that, uh, that have been described and that we all know uh, uh, exist. And, uh, 1.2% in Japan and 1.27% in uh, Europe and 23 or something in the United States. 
um, don't give you much room. Um, the second uh, part of, um, the second major reason why, um, uh, uh, why markets are, um, I, I believe strongly, markets are mispricing geopolitical and other risks is, um, is related to the first, but it's actually a different point. And it is given the pricing um, and given the still opaque and over leveraged financial system, um, the sensitivity because of herding, uh, interlocking, uh, and uh, samely positioned investors, the sensitivity to um, risks is, is extremely high. And I'll give you an example in a moment. Uh, and um, uh, the, the cushion to withstand risks is very low. And the example, of course, is the Swiss franc. Um, it's because of this positioning that from 1.2, when the cap broke in the Swiss franc, it went directly in 10 or 15 minutes to 0.85, and then 15 more minutes back to 1.0. Um, so um, these are two major forces. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Singer. Uh, Martin said, Paul Singer says that actually it's hard to talk about markets, that uh, it is the big institutions, it's the big central bank, and you probably didn't mention, but also <coughs> big institutional investors in the private sector, and that there is a concentration of power there uh, that, 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 that drives what we call markets, and that leads to misperceptions and mispricing. You disagree with what he said, right? Yeah, let me first stress that uh, the risk report published by the World Economic Forum every year and just been published again has shown that geopolitical risk is, as, is seen as the number one threat now. This is the first time ever since we published this report that geopolitical risk is being uh, positioned as prominently. Interstate conflict, governance failure, it is about state collapse. These are the main sort of sources when you talk about geo geopolitical risks. And for us, as a large-scale institutional investors, we manage 220 plus billion dollars and a couple of hundred billion more for customers. I must say that looking at the, the current positioning, I do not see any mispricing with regards to what the expectation is in the market versus our risk profile versus the expected return. Don't forget, the driver of return is risk. And as we have that as a notion, we have to always be aware of that, that this is factoring and pricing in, in the market as we move forward. Now, however, what is to say is that there is a growing geopolitical uncertainty. Naturally, we see that in the votes here. And we see that in the risk report, which cannot be effectively priced. Geopolitical risk cannot be effectively priced. And as Ignurial has made one of these other points, when the Ukraine crisis, and I just take that as an example, emerged the first time. We at Zurich, we took a meeting and we said, what are we going to do with our European equity holdings? What are we going to do with our German holdings? Because that potentially has an impact. And we decided not to move on the back of that because there was just sort of an uncertainty. You cannot capture and translate into a risk. And guess what? The German equity market and European market is at the moment trading at a high because you have to see that in relation to investment alternatives. It is not just one asset class against the other. It is all, asset in, it is all investment opportunities altogether. And the major problem on the back of that is that the global economy is still very fragile and there is limited availability to absorb major shocks, which we are seeing. Now, what the global risk report makes clear is that the very nature of geopolitical risks is changing. And it's not just in the state conflict, war or terrorism, which has impacted its economic policy. It is natural resources. It is cyber statecraft. It is populist sentiment in elections. This year, we're going to have, within the G20, 45% of the G20 electorate is going through elections, naturally posing fairly drastic uncertainty on the back of that. And as an insurer, we look, we look very much at those uh, micro-level risks because these are the ones which do affect the real economy players. And the real economy players, this is you, our customers, many of you, our customers. And obviously, you have this exposure to the capital markets. But what is very important when we talk about geopolitical risk to, to look at is what is the impact on the business 
not just on the financial market, i.e., how are you positioned with regards to the si su supply chain exposure and with regards to the impact on the balance sheet of an organization and not just of the financial markets. And there are a lot of businesses out there which are through this po geopolitical risks. Keep in mind, again, risk is the driver of return, should, deals, should see that as well as opportunity if managed effectively and not just only as a downside exposure. And what is on the back of that absolutely essential is obviously to have a full understanding of the exposure to geopolitical risks and to take the necessary steps to build up a respective uh, resilience. At the, micro, at the micro level then, these risks pose uh, actually on, in front of our doorstep three forms. It's political risk, it is cyber, and I would also say what I have mentioned, very important supply chain. And these take many forms. It is political violence and terrorism. It's increasing, Eastern Ukraine. It is social unrest, which is looting. It is exploration. We just had a metal firms in Bolivia putting up large claims as a, we are largest insurer for political risk. So we see these movements very effectively. It's about currency in convertibility. We have claims in Venezuela on the back of that. Non-honoring of sovereign contracts. A Vietnamese shipyard just posts similar claims to us as well. So there's a lot of movements on the back of that. And there's proof that geopolitical risks are growing. I should say that 2013, and most likely as well 2014, we have seen the highest amount of claims out of political risk exposures. Having said that, it's also the highest capacity, but we do not see any demand and more exp uh, of more uh, risk uh, mitigation. So there is more interest in the topic, and I would uh, imagine on the back of the risk report that to increase further, but there is no more insurance is being bought at this time. So companies of all, side and of all sizes are now victims to massive criminal or state-sponsored cyber attacks. Cyber is, of course, the other nature, which is sort of a result of this geopolitical uncertainty. And this means, of course, one has to prepare effectively for that. At the moment, about 43% of US companies are expected to have suffered data breaches. 43% of all US companies have suffered data breaches on the back of cyber activity in 2013. Now, in closing, what I should say that all of these exposures, as well as others, are captured in the supply chain. In fact, Cyber attacks are within the top five supply chain's concerns. Companies prepare for it, they factor it in, they price it, which flows back into the real economy. And you must understand that each and every link uh, of these exposures do obviously as well flow back to capital markets and financial markets if they then emerge, as we believe that financial markets are, say, reasonably efficient with substantial time lags. And we have to really differentiate between the short-term impacts and the long-term impacts of such uh, volatility in the market. And for me, the question is really, is not whether the markets are mispricing geopolitical risks, but whether we have a full understanding of those risks and whether we are taking the steps to build resilience of finding the full understanding as these risks are more and more intercorrelated, they are more and more transported. They are very transportable on the back of globalization. And the full understanding of that is the basis then to build resilience and as well look to mitigate these risks. And on the back of that, I'm not surprised about the outcome, but I would make a strong argument that we have to differentiate the volatility short term and the impact on financial markets, which is react. The financial markets are reacting. The, the example you took with the, the Swiss National Bank's action and the impact on the currency market, that was pretty clear response and effective pricing in, and we will find now the right balance as we move forward. Thank you very much, Martin Sen from uh, the Zurich Insurance Group. So we have heard two very eloquent and well-argued uh, positions concerning that markets are mispricing uh, geopolitical risk, and we also heard two equally compelling and interesting and persuasive uh, um, points of view. To the contrary, so that's the debate. I, uh, I know that each of the four uh, panelists is eager to jump back and, and rebut and, and, and talk a little bit more about the issues. But before we do that, let me ask you to please hold it for a second. And let's take a few questions from the audience and from social media. 
Uh, and then we will go back and give you time to, to, to go back to this. So please raise your hands and let us uh, know what's your question, if uh, there is any. Then let me, mean, while we get that, let me get, uh, read you one uh, that came from social media. Um, concerning uh, Mr. Frank Ludwig, uh, just tweeted, uh, he says, an optimum in Gini brings, therefore, the highest wealth of the nation, and therefore, it reduces instability. Let me change that question and, and present to you um, the, the issue of inequality. Inequality is present in this conversation, has been present in the last couple of years in ways that was not there uh, in the past. The whole distributional dimensions of uh, uh, policies and all that. Inequality is creating a social unrest, is creating difficulties in, in governance, is creating and is driving and fueling some of the uh, uh, geopolitical risks uh, that Martin Sen mentioned that are uh, identified in the World Economic Forum Global Risk uh, uh, Report. So let me then ask you, and not, not to, one, to all of you, but just one of you or two, just say something about how a heightened awareness, first higher inequality in some countries, but also a heightened uh, intolerance. The peaceful coexistence with inequality has ended, ended a few years ago. In the past, the inequality, is, economic inequality was accepted, tolerated as a fact of life, and it was not a very important issue. Today, it is a very important issue around the world. And that, in some instances, is fueling uh, geopolitical uh, uh, risks. Nuria. Uh, certainly the issue of inequality is an important one even if it's more of a slow motion kind of train wreck rather than a major tail risk that explodes that has significant market impact instantaneously. Uh, we first to understand why it's happening and I think it's a combination of factors. First of all, technological innovation is becoming increasingly capital intensive, skill bias and labor savings. There are even these extreme views that robots and artificial intelligence are going to replace most jobs. We're going to get into singularity, where you know, Stephen Hawking said we'll have to go and uh, colonize other planets because the machines are going to replace humans and replace the human race. That might take 100 years, but that's a risk. Secondly, trade and globalization, whether you like it or not, reduces jobs and incomes of low skill and unskilled. Initially, manufacturing jobs, but now that services are becoming tradable, many of those jobs are being offshored. But tomorrow, instead of being offshore, today a, a radiologist in Mumbai can do the same job as a radiologist in New York or looking at your x-rays for one quarter of the salary. But tomorrow will be a piece of software. We can replace it, and those are going to be replaced. Third of all, we have also these winner-take-all effects, the superstar effect that implies that the superstars in every field get more of the profits coming from the market of billions rather than millions. So all these things are happening. What are the consequences? I would say increasingly social and political unrest and instability. That's one economic uh, and political consequence. Secondly, inequality can even reduce economic growth because you are redistributing income from those who have a higher marginal propensity to spend that are low income or middle income individuals to those who have a higher marginal propensity to save that are essentially high income, work, uh, high income individuals and or corporations. I mean, there's an extreme Marxian view that say the capital is going to self-destroy because you'll have this inequality of wages falling and profit rising, reducing eventually consumption. It's a slow motion movement, but some of the weakness we've seen in consumption growth, even in the US may be driven by that. So you have to worry about it, but don't, I don't think it's something that has a direct market impact. It's something that evolves over time. <clears throat> Paul Singer, inequality increases geopolitical risks. We should keep in mind that the uh, interaction between the driver of economic stability in the world and economic growth, quantitative easing and 0% interest rates, has as its goal, its primary goal, the boosting of asset prices. The secondary effect is a, is a boosting of, in, an attempted boosting of inflation um, or growth. Growth may be a third order effect. and so. What is happening is that the mispricing that uh, exists in uh, world's uh, financial markets because of the forces that I described is exacerbating inequality and at the very time that investors are doing well to very well and the things that investors and successful investors who own bonds, stocks, uh, all kinds of stuff that's going up as a result, direct result of asset inflation, government policy, 
Um, they're doing great. The middle class in the developed world is not doing great. And so the inequality is a function, actually, of government policy uh, 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 and uh, social unrest is a function of the inequality uh, and the seeming growing so you, distortion. So you give more uh, governments a role in the driving inequality. Nouriel was uh, more emphasizing technology, globalization, and other uh, uh, but trends. I make a comment on what Paul said, yes. Asset reflation helps more the rich that have more of those assets. But if you had not done the QE and these economies like the US ended up in a double deep or a triple deep recession, then losses of jobs and income for the low income individual would be more severe. So more of the benefit have gone to the wealthy. But and the idea that this QE have helped on to the wealthy, think about the alternative, would have had another recession in no, the US. If you would and had, therefore the impact is different from the If one you would had discuss. more pro growth mm -hmm. policies in the fiscal tax uh, trade. Uh, area, you wouldn't have the need to support the global <coughs> economy by 0% interest rates for six years and uh, quantitative easing. Thank you. Martin, and I think also you wanted to chip in. Inequality is nothing new. We had inequality for a long, long time, and we will continue having inequality. What I think is very new following the economic crisis is to have a very deep crisis of confidence. People losing hope, people questioning leadership, they question political leadership, they question business leadership. And you think that drives geopolitical risks? Which is naturally leading to more short-term reactions and, and response. Yeah. It leads to populism, as I've mentioned, very short-term. And that is obviously one where I should say inequality as such cannot be taken off the coast of the volatility we have. It is rather to concern on how we deal with it in terms of bringing stability into the system with regards to geopolitics. The basis for that is, let's be clear, if you talk about hope and expectations going back on integrity, say what you do and do what you say. And do that for the good and for the long term and not just for the short term. And that's what we're confronting it with. And that's where financial markets markets keep responding to it. And that's why we see this volatility. Thank you. Do you want I will just add that from our historical perspective over the last year, the inequality issue for us was about corruption. For us, you mean in Ukraine. Ukraine. And in Ukraine, the heightened awareness of this inequality of a certain segment of the population that was corrupt and the rest of the population that was suffering through this corruption. The fact that we've, we've heightened our awareness, the, fight, the fact that people were willing to die on the streets in order to, to stop this corruption is a positive thing. The strength of civil society that comes out of this heightened awareness is now the check and balance on any new government, post-parliament elections, post-new presidential elections, to ensure that the next government doesn't follow in the footsteps of previous governments. And so that heightened awareness, although it, it increases risk to some extent, it actually reduces risk in the sense that now the demands of civil society, because of technology, because of knowledge awareness, are, are the demands of civil society are so much greater that, that, that next, the next government's our government, the government after us, will not be able to act in the same ways that previous governments have. You know, the, the, everything's been opened up to the public, and that civil society's check and balance is a very positive thing for reducing risk going forward. So, and let me extend that point from Ukraine to the world. The point is that the, the heightened intolerance uh, with inequality that we have seen in recent years is also combined with a heightened uh, intolerance for corruption. You could also argue that corruption has always existed, but you can also argue that in recent years we have seen a higher intolerance. People are not willing to take it anymore in places like Ukraine and in others. And also your point to the fact that in discussions about the drivers of inequality, there is a lot of conversations about macroeconomic factors, QE, or fiscal policies and taxes or technology <coughs> and trade and all of that. But I think it's very important to add the factor that the minister has mentioned that it's in a lot of countries inequality is driven by corruption. And that is a very important issue that also drives uh, geopolitical risks. Let me give, uh, ask again if there is anyone that has a question or points, and just, sir, in the back, just tell us your name and, and uh, your affiliation, please. I'm Sushil Vadwani from Caxton Associates. I wanted to take issue with Paul Singer's point that QE should necessarily be accompanied by, with uh, rising inequality. Uh, it's this 
you know, it's, it's the current precise design of QE that has the effect Paul talks about. Uh, instead, if QE had been used to provide money to finance fiscal expenditure, that it need not necessarily have had that effect. So for example, in Europe, if the ECB were to finance infrastructure spending through the EIB, it does, it A has a bigger stimulative effect on growth than buying bonds, uh, and B doesn't necessarily have the uh, inequality raising effect. Second example, some of us argued some years ago that QE should be used to essentially mail vouchers to everyone in the population. Uh, that again has a very different impact on inequality. Thank you, Paul. That was for you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> talking about the design of, uh, of uh, QE and what to do with the money um, is, is uh, interesting. And of course, all of these governments have the opportunity to create infrastructure uh, and uh, voucher uh, and other helicopter money uh, uh, outcomes. But that doesn't cancel the point that if you're discussing inequality, um, one of the main forces exacerbating inequality at a time, it's not unique inequality. In fact, global inequality is narrowing as uh, hundreds of millions of people, uh, as you know, join the middle class uh, across the globe. But it's widening to close to record levels, particularly in the United States, in the face of economic uncertainty among the middle class. And that kind of uh, inequality uh, 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 growth um, is something that makes people edgy. And I think that's, I think that's the point. In the 1970s, uh, uh, I believe, the last peak, uh, depending on how you measure it, of uh, inequality in the United States, it was a different, uh, it was a different relationship between uh, investors and uh, the middle class or the investing class the beneficiaries of quantitative easing. Um, so, so I think it's, uh, inequality is exacerbated by uh, quantitative easing. I want to go back to geopolitical risks yeah. and their pricing. Uh, you had something you wanted to add to this, Nuria? Well, you know, on what uh, Paul Singer said, you know, yes, all advanced economies need to do <clears throat> structural reforms to increase potential growth, regulation, taxation, you name it. But what's a constraint to low growth in the Eurozone, Japan, US? is not the supply of goods because output is well below the potential they might have fallen. There is a problem of aggregate demand. So in the short run, you need to do monetary and fiscal stimulus and credit to boost aggregate demand while you're working on doing the structure reform that increase potential growth. So the two things are not inconsistent with each other. Abenomic was monetary and fiscal stimulus and structural reform, Ted Arrow. Draginomics is about having structural reform, but even Draghi says we have a problem with aggregate demand in the Eurozone, and therefore we did not have the right monetary and fiscal policy. On the geopolitical risk or political risk, if I look around the world, yes, there is political risk. Uh, Syriza could win in Greece, Podemos in, uh, in Spain, uh, Renzi could fail in Italy, Le Pen could win in France. Uh, you have had the troubles of Russia and Ukraine, Argentina, Venezuela, Thailand. There are plenty of countries in trouble, but you look at the markets, every time this political risk, even national, let alone geopolitical rise, stock market correct, currency weaken, bond prices are adjust, CDS spreads widen, whether it is excessive or not, we can debate it, but actually markets are actually quite sensitive to the fact that more than just economic news, political and policy news and policy mistake have an impact on the economy and have an impact on the market. If anything, they've been more than fully priced in, I would say. Let me talk about another major <laughs> geopolitical risk and how is it being priced, mispriced, understood or misunderstood, and that is low oil, low oil prices, something that has changed the world that was not anticipated uh, uh, here last year or anywhere, in fact, and that is having consequences. The most obvious ones are in countries that are highly dependent in oil exports and are going to be destabilized, are being destabilized by that. The usual list is, is well known, uh, is uh, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, others. But there are second order consequences for low oil. There are consequences, for example, there is a, a, a wide variety of projects uh, that are being canceled, postponed. Uh, that um, or fall exploration and all development, energy projects that are no longer viable at the current prices. And th these are, are also transforming um, the, the, the nature of risks. 
I don't want to go back to market risks. I want to center the conversation on non-market risks driven by political decisions. So I would like each of you to comment on the political consequences of low oil. Beyond saying that all these countries that are oil exporters and big spenders are going to be stressed. We know that. So what are some of the second order geopolitical consequences of low oil? Paul. It's not an accident that um, what, what our uh, energy traders think is a um, one, roughly one million barrel a day uh, shortfall in uh, uh, demand has caused uh, more than a 50% um, uh, uh, drop in the price of oil. It's, there's a case to be made, a good case to be made, that it's an engineered drop meant primarily to jostle not only alternative energy industry uh, uh, companies, uh, um, but geopolitically uh, actions against Iran, uh, Russia, uh, perhaps others, uh, that it has geopolitical uh, uh, impact. And I think that's very important. Let's talk about the United States just for a moment. Um, the energy industry, the alternative energy industry, is perhaps the growth story or the uh, capital spending story. Not that it's the bulk of it, but it's um, the major, uh, a major source of growth in the United States. The fact that the rug is being pulled out uh, suddenly uh, from the alternative en energy industry in the United States has uh, uh, consequences that will radiate out. I, I don't think we can, at this early stage, just weeks after the collapse, days, weeks, whatever, it's just been in the last few weeks, um, assess all the follow-on uh, effects. But I think it's going to be very meaningful. Uh, would you like to keep in on this? Nuria. Uh, I slightly disagree with Paul on uh, what are the motivations of Saudi Arabia. Of course, people argue Saudi Arabia is trying to hit its enemies, whether it's Russia, because they're not playing ball on Syria with Assad, as opposed to Iran, that is the major uh, geopolitical threat to Saudi Arabia. But if you think about it, you know, having a loss of maybe $100 billion of the reserves in Saudi Arabia because you want to hit Russia, you can spend 10, 20 billion of that, arm the rebels in Syria, and you can get more out of it. And the behavior of Russia is not being changed. The paradox with Russia is, by the way, that with sanctions and low oil prices, Putin is becoming more aggressive, less, rather than less aggressive. Why? Because his perception is that the West is out for regime change, like we had with Saddam in Iraq or with uh, Gaddafi in the case of Libya. If that's his perception, he's going to become more aggressive in the Middle East, in the Baltics, in the Balkans, in the case of Ukraine. So first observation. The case of Iran, same thing. Uh, the threat is coming from Iran. If Iran reaches a deal with the United States, Saudi Arabia will be a big strategic loser. But low oil prices make more likely that the regime in Tehran is going to be likely to do a deal with the West on the nuclear stuff because they need to have the reduction of sanctions. So paradoxically, it will be in the interest of Saudi Arabia to have high oil prices so that the regime in Tehran doesn't want to deal, do a deal with the, with the West. So this argument that the Saudis are out for geopolitical reasons, I don't think so. My view is that, uh, that Saudi Arabia is just a typical behavior of an oligopolistic leader who's doing predatory pricing. You keep prices low for a while, you get rid of all the high marginal cost producer, shale gas guys, Venezuela, you name it, and you commit to a schedule of fixed investment and capacity so that everybody else is going to underinvest in capacity for the next few years. If you do that, in the short term you have low prices, but in the medium term you'll have slightly higher prices and a larger market share. It's an economic argument, it's not a geopolitical argument for Saudi Arabia. I'll just add, though, that I think that the, the reaction of Russia, the reaction of President Putin to low oil prices is not necessarily predictable. What's happening today, his reaction today, and his reaction two months from now may be very different. So I, I would say that low oil prices in this case have, uh, are, are, potentially will have a positive effect, increasing the cost for him to continue this very expensive war that he's started. And he may, he may begin to think twice at some point about the economic costs, even though he doesn't like as you say, some of the signals that he sees in, in that. From, from the other perspective, it hits Ukraine uh, in a negative way because, as you say, shale gas now becomes something that we had hoped for to help us with our energy independence and now becomes much less credibly profitable for those players in Ukraine and they're starting to step away from some of those projects. So there's a balance and it's unclear how to actually define in the end where these lower oil prices will take us. 
For a central point about the, the geopolitics of low oil is that a lot of these governments that are stressed uh, uh, fiscally and otherwise by your low oil are going to pick, pick fights abroad to distract from problems at home. You will have more incentives for leaders to start uh, using uh, international frictions and international conflicts to take away from the very difficult situation at home due to uh, cuts, budget cuts and all of the fiscal adjustments that they will have to face in reaction to low oil. So we are coming to an end and there are two things that uh, we are, uh, have left to do. First, I'm going to give you two minutes to each of you to summarize again uh, your points, perhaps add uh, a, a new perspective. Uh, for and against the motion that uh, um, markets are mispricing geopolitical risks. This is what your last shot at trying to persuade the audience. Uh, and then we are going to take a vote again to see which side uh, did a better job of persuading, of changing perspectives uh, on those around here and around the world. Minister. I'll just repeat that I think many of these risks are no longer market risks that are able to be priced. I think your comments, Mr. Sen, about cyber attacks, for example, are such a, there is such a great amount of unknown. The reactions of individual political leaders to these changes in, in commodity prices and how they react, whether, whether, whether they react in one way or the other, I think that uh, the, the risks, the geopolitical risks that we're talking about are practically impossible to be priced properly. The markets are guessing, but the markets are as often wrong as they are, cor as, as they are correct. Nuria. <laughs> well, some of the most extreme uh, tail risks geopolitical are things on which we cannot assign a probability. What's a probability of a cyber attack that really destroys our economy? Is it 1%, 0.5 or 5%? What's the risk of another 9-11 type of attack as opposed to terrible uh, episodes of terrorism that are contained? What's the risk that after SARS and Ebola and other cases you get really a global pandemic rather than a localized uh, kind of pandemic of one sort or another. Uh, what's the risk that you'll have a major war among great powers like between China and somebody else? I think that first of all those risks are still extremely low and they're not easily priced and markets are worrying about these things and companies are taking action to deal with for example the risk of cyber warfare. So there is policy reactions and there are market reactions to try to insure yourself against it either operationally or financially or otherwise. So we live in a world in which lots of very extreme and ugly stuff could happen but it's not obvious that markets are mispricing. Take even 9-11. 9-11 uh, did not cause the recession of 2001. That recession started with the internet bust at the beginning of 2001. And by the end of 2001, in spite of 9-11, because of the monetary and the fiscal stimulus, we were already out of the recession. Yes, the market for a few days panicked. The Fed flooded the markets as they should with liquidity because you would have had the run. And guess what? Even the biggest geopolitical shock of our times, 9-11, I was there, I was going to teach at NYU that morning and I saw the towers in fire and collapsing. Even that in the amount there of three months led to a huge economic recovery in the United States. And paradoxically, the policy response, monetary fiscal, led to the buildup of the bubble that had started in housing and credit that led actually to the global financial crisis. So even an extreme geopolitical event like a major terrorist attack may, with the right policy response, be contained and lead to economic recovery as opposed to a financial meltdown. So are we really mispricing this risk as opposed to knowing that are contained or containable even when they do occur? Thank you. <clears throat> Paul Singer. There's no question that uh, central bank policy uh, over the last uh, uh, post, uh, the post-crisis period has, um, uh, in adding uh, the better part of $15 trillion to the central bank balance sheets and zero percent interest rates throughout the de uh, developed world, has caused a major distortion in asset prices, a distortion upward. Um, risk is mitigated as an investor by price and yield. If you have a margin of safety, a cushion of uh, protection, uh, in price and yield, um, it's, it's meaningful. There's convexity in bonds uh, and um, the absence of yield and the absence of good value in equity markets uh, exacerbates risk. And so um, my point is that I think by definition the um, actions of government, which um, you could say, and you might be right, that it um, would have been worse uh, in the absence of just quantitative easing without the appropriate fiscal um, uh, policies. But in fact, 
um, uh, these policies have not, this combination of policies has not restored growth, and therefore I believe strongly that um, uh, financial asset prices market, markets are mispricing risk uh, uh, throughout the world. Thank you. Martin said your final remark. The, the, the risk report from the World Economic Forum has shown this year clearly that uh, geopolitical risk is being seen as the number one threat. It has been recognized uh, as the number one threat in all its components. It has been translated on the impact in all its components. And we know that it has a high uncertainty and with that the potential volatility, which again is factored back into the financial markets. Every market participant Every agent in the economy has the opportunity to act or not to react and is doing so. And with that, it is flowing back into the prices, be it at different margins, be it at different volatilities, but it is reflected in the prices at the short term leading to higher distortion, at the longer term uh, smoothing out, and with that, geopolitical risk is factored in, in the markets at the moment. Thank you very much. So let's see what the audience think. Uh, please vote. Uh, you Again, you can go to that uh, website and just say that uh, if you agree or disagree with the notion that markets are mispricing geopolitical risk. Yes, agree. No, disagree. Please vote. We already have 22 votes, 23. And let's see how this compares with the first vote. Okay, there it is. <laughs> so there is a slight change, but we're still getting votes. But um, an evenly divided audience now, and it was not evenly divided when we started. Uh, so um, we have now a conclusion of who, which of the two sides were more persuasive. <laughs> Uh, Natalia Anjarescu is the Minister of Finance of Ukraine. Nouriel Rubin is a Professor of Economics and International Business at, at NYU. Martin Sen is the CEO of Zurich Insurance Group. Paul Singer is the CEO of Elliott Management. Please join me in thanking them for a wonderful job. <laughs>